been working on this stuff for a very long time, been involved with OpenACC since its very first invention here. So the future of uh, HPC of HPC programming. So this is a, a small digression from OpenACC in particular, but what we are looking at, this is when I say we, I mean, we're in the NVIDIA HPC uh, software development team. A, a range of ways to program of whatever parallel machine you've got, including math libraries, which I don't even show here. But then when you're writing your programs, standard language parallelism. So Will Sawyer should be quite happy here. We think that is, should be, and needs to be the default for how you want to program your, write, write your parallel programs. It doesn't make parallel programming easy, but it makes writing the program easier, particularly if it's a part of the language itself. But they don't include everything in the standard languages. Like I have two different types of machines. Where do I run this? Where do I run this particular parallel construct? Or I need to copy data to a different piece of memory. How do I describe that memory? Well, that's not in the language. So we always today, and we'll likely always have to uh, augment the language. Directives are one way to do that. And so incremental optimizations with OpenACC, one way or another. And then uh, there's you, need a way to integrate and interoperate with uh, lower level models, like in this case, CUDA, like assembly language other, with other machines. Our intent, this is again, our is the uh, NVIDIA HPC group, is to uh, move in a direction so that the programmers, that's the applications writers, are moving to the left in this model, moving towards more standard languages as much as possible and try to automate, uh, all, automate as many decisions in the implementation as, uh, as you possibly can. Um, so let's talk about some of the new features. And uh, Jeff Larkin mentioned this is uh, the error handler. So I'm going to go into this a little bit, uh, very briefly in a little bit more detail. And we've been working on this, as he said, for some number of years. What happens when one rank dies? Well, the other ranks become zombies. They're waiting for uh, this one rank to communicate with them. And you can use up your whole allocation uh, on a dead application. So what we have added now to the spec, and this was um, the NVIDIA uh, implementation going back now some years had a prototype implementation of this with that was not nearly so clean and so we built on top of that as Jeff mentioned we're uh, added this to the spec we have not put this into our implementation yet but we will at, at some point in the near future I hope al allowing the programmer to register a callback saying if you get an error event here's the handler and then the handler will be called with a description of the event, a description of the uh, uh, API information, like uh, what what sort of device are you running on, and then can print an error message, and in this case, do an NPI abort. So that was the intent for this particular new feature. This was one that uh, I was particularly interested in getting into the uh, specification. And I want to, uh, as an aside, say the uh, committee process. You have a, the committee works uh, really well for finding ways to improve your, um, you've got a great idea. You have to integrate this with an existing standard and interoperate with all the different ways and the committee will do that for you. So this did take a couple of years because there were, this, is a, this was a big change, uh, a big addition to the, uh, to the implementation. Now, I want to say for the past five or six years, we've had a couple of pretty good interns joining our team, particularly in the GPU uh, uh, compiler team at the NVIDIA HPC group, usually for the summer. And some of them we've hired and kept on. So we try to give them a project they can complete or at least make real progress on that's not critical to our success, but which if successful would show some interesting results. And we've had a number of these projects which have shown some really interesting uh, uh, things and some of them have even been productized. This summer, we had two projects that did some interesting work that we're gonna try to productize over the coming year. I'm just gonna present these. And this first one is, you have a bunch of small data movements. So here I've got these small structs and I have to copy them over to the device. Well, the structs are only eight bytes long. And for me to copy that to the device with a, something like a CUDA mem copy or in our runtime would be the, uh, the runtime API version, the CUDA mem copy, the, the uh, overhead to start the CUDA mem copy is two microseconds. The data transfer time is practically nothing. So I got this two, two microseconds three times, it's six microseconds. This is this is uh, this is abysmal. Can we improve that? So uh, now you may say, okay, it's only two microseconds. I don't really care about that. But we have some people that are really, really quite interested and really dive into the 
um, uh, the details of the performance of their application. And they find these problems. They say, you need to fix this. And some of those folks are in Switzerland. I'm not blending Will Sawyer for this, but, but he's in the right country anyway. And uh, so what we're gonna be doing, what we're looking at doing now is packaging this information up into a, uh, uh, a kernel launch. So you package into the, the data and the addresses, into the arguments to a kernel, and we run a kernel. Now the kernel launch overhead, it's a little bit more than two microseconds, but it's less than five. So if you have more than two blocks of data, it's faster to launch a kernel to move the data than it is to do the memcopy to move the data. In the case on the right, this is Fortran, there's allocatable arrays, the compiler doesn't know the size of this data. So we make these decisions at runtime. And the other thing behind the scenes here is with these allocatable arrays, there's this descriptor with the array that holds things like the array bounds, the size and the strides for each dimension. And those descriptors are pretty much always small data and they need to be moved over to the device as well. So we're thinking this would be a small performance improvement that will some users will uh, see the performance benefits of, particularly the users in uh, Switzerland. Another in intern project that uh, we're finishing up uh, this week is an ability to generate multiple versions of device code, multiple kernels, if you will. So here's a parallel loop. And we want to generate multiple versions of a kernel and decide at runtime which one to generate. For instance, if the trip count is small, it might yeah, on the CPU, you might do this. You might have what's called alt code. If it's small, you'd go to a vector loop or you just unroll the loop. Or if it's uh, data is aligned, you'd go to one that uses SIMD operations or uses SIMD instruct, uses aligned instructions for the SIMD operations. Or the compiler might peel off a few iterations to get to where the data is aligned and then use SIMD uh, aligned instructions to do the rest of the iterations of that loop. So GPUs, like NVIDIA GPUs have these vector loads and stores as well. So you can load and store multiple, multiple operations at the uh, multiple operands with a single instruction onto a, a single thread. And you can get some memory bandwidth performance improvement if you take advantage of those. So one of the things we're looking at here is to generate uh, a normal kernel. So this is what the normal kernel roughly would look like is you get your uh, index or their thread and you do your operation for the thread and you launch the thread with, okay, this is abstracted, it's not exact, but it gives you the op. Uh, the idea, if you're a CUDA programmer, generate a second version of that kernel that we're using the uh, vector loads and stores and doing two operations at a time and then a vector store. Now with the NVIDIA GPUs, this only works if the data is aligned. And when you launch it, you launch it with half a number of threads. So it's a little bit challenging to do this test on the device, particularly because the launch configuration is different. Um, but we're looking at uh, ways to do this. We're looking at, uh, and there are other, other um, uh, uh, cases where we're uh, looking at these optimization, like um, you might not know whether X and Y alias with each other. Well, here we know the loop is parallel, so we know something about the aliasing, but in general, if you know more about they don't alias each other whatsoever, you can do other more interesting optimizations. So we think this is, uh, we're quite excited by this, uh, where this is gonna take us. Okay, let's go on to the next one. And a little bit about debugging. And I'm gonna mention uh, two things. This, this particular feature, the auto compare feature, this has been in the compilers and available for a number of years. I don't know how many of you have tried this. If you're porting your program from CPUs to GPUs, one of the things you wanna do is know that the program is correct. And this is not just did the compiler generate correct code, but did I parallelize it correctly? Did I get the right data over to the device Am I bringing the right data back to the host? Am I dealing with stale data or is it up-to-date data? When it, am I getting round-off error differences? If the answers are different, is it a significant difference or is it a round-off error difference? There's a lot of issues having, have, issues having to do with correctness and stability, which parallel programmers have to deal with even with on, a, on, a, on CPUs and on MPI programs, any types of parallelism, you have many of these uh, same issues. Well, what we're trying to do is to uh, automate so some of the error detection here and help the programmer uh, find and uh, identify errors. So we've implemented is this feature which we call auto compare where the compiler generates two versions of this loop. One version will run on the CPU, one version will run on the GPU. And when the loop is done, it then compares the results. And here the results are the summation result and the X result. And when you run the program, you compile it with GPU equals auto compare and you run the program, it says, oh, this result the, the uh, summation result is different and it gives you the absolute difference and it gives you the um, actual number and the relative number and the, and the absolute difference. Well, the difference is relatively small. Um, there are 
uh, in this case, it, it's in the third digit. Uh, the, I chose this with a data set that I knew was going to give us some interesting differences. And then it would at the end tell you that um, uh, how many errors it, or differences, errors it found. And uh, what this allows the programmer to do is to focus on as, he's, as he or she is porting each part of the program to enable the auto compare for that part and make sure that part of the program is working correctly. And then as the scope gets larger and larger to move the auto compare uh, to outer parts of the region and make sure that you're dealing with all um, uh, non-stale data over the whole program. And we've seen people when they're porting their program use this to uh, uh, convince themselves that their port to the GPU is correct. Another one that's coming up, this is another piece of work which we did because of bugs in a application, also in Switzerland, but again, I'm not blaming uh, uh, Will for that because it was not ICON or any weather code whatsoever. But it had to do with, you're dealing with these data structures and Will mentioned this, you've got data structure. In this case, it was a Fortran with derived types and you have pointer members and I'm doing something with a pointer member and I change the pointer member, I do something with that pointer member. Well, here I updated I got a copy of W on the device and I updated the, uh, the pointer on the device. In the second case, the pointer didn't get updated. So the pointer on the device for W% percent work is pointing to the wrong data. How can you detect that? Can you detect that? And can you automate that detection? So this is one of the things that these programs get larger and uh, these data structures get more interesting, this sort of thing is gonna be uh, more important. So we're working on implementing this as well. We think this is uh, help, help programmers determine exactly where pointers get misattached. And um, this will work, there are similar things in C as well. I, I showed this as a Fortran program, the same thing will work in uh, C programs with C pointers and C data structures or C++, what have you. Um, so these are some of the things we're working on is um, uh, features, uh, performance and debugging. Our, Goal, the long-term, I'm wrapping up here. This is my last slide, although I have a couple of builds here. The uh, is a performance, productivity, and portability, not necessarily that order. So these are the three Ps. So good languages and intelligent compilers should make writing parallel programs easier. It doesn't make parallel programming easy, but it should be easier to write the program. So things like loop vectorization versus SIMD intrinsic. So you got to use SIMD intrinsics which is what Intel was proposing 25 years ago for using their SIMD instructions. Well, then when they go to the next generation of SIMD instructions, you have to rewrite those intrinsics. Think, think SSE versus AVX versus AVX 512. If you use vectorizing compilers, well, you vectorize the loop. You don't have to change your program at all. And parallel programming should look more like that. You're writing a program in a way that the target, as the target changes, you should not need to change your program. So things like, here I have this parallel program. We want to use, uh, run this on a CPU. So here I have with OpenACC, I wanna run this parallel program on a CPU and I'm gonna identify the parallelism. CPU or on a GPU in this case, identify the par both loops I want to run in parallel. If I'm doing this on a uh, GPU, I might identify gang parallelism for the outer loop and vector parallelism and for the inner loop, or I might leave that to the compiler. Now, OpenMP, I'm going to do a little bit of a dig at OpenMP, and then I'll, you'll see where it winds up. With OpenMP on a CPU, you might want the outer loop to be parallel on threads, the inner loop to be SIMD. If you're running this OpenMP on a GPU, you might want the outer loop to be across teams and the inner loop across threads on a team. But now you have to write different programs depending on your target. This is a bad. This is this is bad. This is not good. The uh, the OpenMP solution was to add the meta directive, which allows you to say, for this target, use this directive, for that target, use other directive, and similarly for the inner loop. This is not a productive solution. I went from writing a couple of words to writing whole paragraphs to describe the parallelism here. And I'm, I'm out of time. So what our, where the direction OpenMP is going, or that we hope OpenMP is, is with their new loop construct, which is more like the OpenACC loop construct, which allows the programmer to do less typing and offloads more of that work to the compiler to uh, determine how to map that parallelism to the target. I'm going to uh, dial in there. So we've been working on OpenMP implementation as well. Uh, unlike uh, Joel, we're trying to map our OpenMP implementation into our OpenMP, OpenACC runtime. So it's a dual problem.